Hello, and thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar series. I'm Tinye Verkaitis, the Executive Director of PSRPA, that's Physicians for Social Responsibility. Our goal with this series is to keep our members and the public informed about threats to public health and our environment, while also sharing solutions and or ways to advocate for change. You'll note that our next webinar will be Fractured, the Body Burden of Living Near Fracking on September 14th. If you have suggestions for topics or speakers, please connect with me at the email address shared at the top of the slide. Today, we're joined by Dr. Richard Tolan, a retired gastroenterologist who became a member of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps in 2017 and has given over 30 climate-related presentations, many pertaining to health impacts. Before I turn it over, I'll just ask you to put questions or comments into chat. Feel free to use Q&A as well, and we'll monitor those as they come in. Thank you, and I'll pass it to Dr. Tolan. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. So, if we look around the country, we see the same housing patterns in every state, every metropolitan area. African Americans living in densely populated urban ghettos with few amenities, with increased incidence of heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and COVID mortality, surrounded by whites in green areas with lots of amenities and better health. None of this came about by accident. It was in large part the intended outcome of a sustained policy of forced segregation by the federal government in cooperation with white supremacists and local governments all over the country, and with complicity of liberal politicians who espouse civil rights platforms. The Federal Housing Authority and the Interstate Highway Program helped suburbanize the nation on a whites only basis. If we define a ghetto, as a neighborhood created by public policy with a shortage of opportunities and barriers to exit, it's clear that our government has created ghettos for African-Americans. There was no racial segregation in the 19th century. Blacks, while often living in poorer neighborhoods, were living in scattered areas in almost every city and were not prevented from attaining the housing they could afford. Uh, that changed in the 20th century. What I plan to do is to review the history of housing discrimination and to show a causal relationship between the consequent housing patterns and the health of the victims and their descendants today. So there was a, a shortage of housing in the 1930s due to the depression and reluctance of banks to lend to all but the most wealthy. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Techward Homes in Atlanta, in 1935 on the left and more recently uh, today. Uh, this was the first public housing project built by the Public Works Administration and was designed to address the housing needs of working people. The Public Works Administration had a quote, neighborhood composition rule, end quote, and this housing project was for whites only. They raised an integrated North neighborhood and built a whites only development, evicting many African American families who had nowhere to go except already overcrowded black neighborhoods. Racial zoning had already been established in Atlanta. The result was a further increased population density that helped to turn African American neighborhoods into slums. So this is, this is a photo of the Rosemont shipyards in Richmond, California on the left and the housing project built for the workers on the right, circa 1944. This was the largest shipyard in the United States. It was building warships for the Pacific Fleet during World War II. And as you might expect, there was a huge dramatic influx of labor need and need for housing during, these, uh, during the early 40s. As, this, uh, uh, as the war effort got underway. During the New Deal, farm laborers and domestic workers had been excluded from the new minimum wage law at the demand of Southern Democrats because most farm and domestic workers in the South were African-American. So many of them migrated to these new job openings in the North and West, which paid better. 
So the government began a program of public, of public housing to accommodate this influx of new workers. In Richmond, uh, the public housing that they built was explicitly and officially segregated. In Richmond, uh, the, 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 uh, the housing for blacks was intended to be temporary. And so it was shoddily constructed and placed next to the shipyards. The white housing was intended to be permanent, and so it was built better and closer to the residential areas. But even with these new housing developments, there still wasn't enough housing for all the workers. And so they developed what was called a worker guest program, where, where white workers uh, could lease rooms and rent rooms in the white neighborhoods. And they had a loan program uh, to help white homeowners uh, uh, renovate their homes to accommodate these new workers. And so the housing shortage was, was uh, alleviated for whites, but not for blacks. Uh, many blacks began doubling up in, into multifamily units. Uh, many lived in cardboard shacks, barns, tents, and some commuted long distances. Uh, even the, uh, the, the housing authority required segregation even in, in uh, recreational and cultural activities uh, Boy Scouts, uh, for example, and playgrounds and community centers were all segregated. Banks at the time would only give uh, mortgages to the wealthy to uh, wealthy buyers, but not to working class people unless the mortgages were insured. So the Federal Housing Authority was created to insure mortgage loans, but they had an openly stated prohibition against insuring loans to African Americans. In addition, returning white veterans from the war were entitled to get mortgages without a down payment. Uh, this was not available to African-American returning soldiers. The result was that whites eventually moved out of the public housing, African-Americans moved in, rendering Richmond, which had previously been a, a sleepy integrated community, rendering Richmond a black ghetto with inadequate and congested housing. So the Federal Housing Authority not only refused to insure loans for integrated communities, uh, they wouldn't even insure loans for white communities that were adjacent to black communities. This is a photograph of a, of a six foot high concrete wall. The Federal Housing Association, Federal Housing Authority required the builder to build to separate the whites only complex that they were supporting from a nearby black community so that to lessen the likelihood that there may be encroachment of blacks upon the, in the, into the white neighborhood. This is a photograph of, uh, of Levittown, uh, Long Island on the left and Levittown, Bucks County, the second Levittown community on the right uh, in the 1950s. Uh, William Levitt, had government helped with loan guarantees so that he could build his enormous development uh, in, in uh, Long Island on the left, a new huge planned suburban community. Uh, this enabled, uh, basically developed one of the first large scale uh, planned suburban communities. But a requirement for FHA backing was that the community had to be whites only and that each deed had to have a restrictive covenant preventing even resale to African-Americans. There was a fellow, Vince Meriday, who was an African-American World War II veteran who owned the trucking company that was hired by William Levitt to haul in the cement and the wallboard for his uh, development. But he was unable to buy a home there even though he tried. The photo on the right uh, because Levitt's first program was so wildly successful with lots of uh, whites buying uh, relatively inexpensive government subsidized homes, he went on to do the same in Bucks County on the right. Uh, he used the same black owned trucking company. Restrictive covenants were no longer legal in uh, Pennsylvania at the end of the 50s. Uh, after several years of trying to find a seller, an African American couple he was a World War II vet. Both, he, both the husband and wife were both college grads and both had the middle-class jobs. They finally, after several years, finally found a white owner who was willing to sell them their home, but 
primarily because they were offering so much more than anyone else because they were desperate to find housing. This is what happened. The, the, this was the, the photo on the right is the scene of the day they moved in. There were over a hundred whites accumulating outside their home, yelling epithets. Uh, they threw rocks in through the window. Uh, they took the property next door and raised Confederate flags. Uh, they blared loud music at night. And this went on for weeks and weeks uh, with police watching and doing nothing. The fact that uh, these weren't just a few rogue police officers, the fact that this went on, and obviously the police authorities and superiors knew what was going on, it was in the newspapers, uh, this therefore really amounted to state-sanctioned violence, state-sanctioned terrorism. Uh, after a few months, the district attorney put a stop to it, but the harassment didn't stop, and a, a while later the uh, couple moved out because they never felt safe. Um, it wasn't just Pennsylvania. In Chicago, in the first 10 months of 1947, there were 26 arson bombings of black households in integrated neighborhoods adjacent to overcrowded black neighborhoods. There were no arrests. Most of the black families had incomes higher and paid more for their homes than their white neighbors who were attacking them. And similar events occurred all over the country. The failure of law enforcement to protect and prosecute was tantamount to state-sponsored terrorism and clearly denial of constitutional protections. So the, the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, was created to insure mortgages uh, and, and, re, and remortgages for whites only. What they did is uh, local real estate agents were employed to determine the value of properties to be insured. And there was a published handbook to advise the local real estate agents how they should value a property. That's where the word redlining came about. This was a map drawn of uh, Philadelphia in 1937. And the definitions given to the local real estate agents was that the red areas were considered hazardous and not worthy of investment. And they were defined as flat terrain, odors, paved, manufacturing, and inhabited by immigrants and Negroes. The green areas that were most worthy of, uh, of loan support were defined as being wooded, shaded, golf courses, rolling hills, white residents. And if you look at this map of Philadelphia, for those of you who you know, are familiar with Philadelphia, the redlined areas in the, this is North Philly here, mostly African-American. This is West Philly here, uh, mostly African-American. And this is South Philly, which in the 1930s was mostly Jewish and Italian immigrants. The green area over here is the main line. Now, the redlining didn't create the disparities, but it codified it into law and prevented uh, people who are living in these red, red areas from getting any kind of government help uh, to, with their mortgages the same way people in the green areas could. So a summary of the New Deal policies. Uh, they segregated housing for workers employed by the CCC and the TVA. Uh, the PWA financed construction of segregated housing for working class. They established minimum wage for most but excluded domestic and farm workers at the demand of Southern white supremacists. The Federal Housing Authority jumpstarted housing by ensuring mortgages issued by private lenders for white homeowners. And the HOLC staved off foreclosures by refinancing and insuring mortgages for white homeowners in the green areas, but not for African American homeowners in the red areas. The Federal government didn't do it alone. They had a partnership with local government and local citizens. So zoning had been established to keep industry and the poor out of white suburbs and thereby concentrated them in African-American neighborhoods. Uh, restrictive covenants and efforts, and efforts to, to uh, circumvent them when they became illegal. I've already talked about the vigilante groups and the state supported uh, violence. And then there were the predatory realtors, the blockbusting. 
uh, realtors and speculators would spread fear in white neighborhoods that were adjacent to African-American neighborhoods. Uh, they would spread fear, uh, telling them that they better sell their house, home soon because African-Americans were moving in and their home prices would fall. They then bought the homes and sold them oftentimes to African-Americans at much higher rates. African-Americans were willing to pay more than whites for the same housing because they were so desperate for adequate housing. That put a lie to the notion that African-Americans would depress market value. It was the fear and the FHA policy to reduce the value of African-American homes that led to falling value for white owned homes in transition neighborhoods. Now, in 1968, the Fair Housing uh, Act was passed and that was uh, 53 years ago. Um, however, the act, uh, first of all, did not provide with any effective enforcement. So it was uh, often ignored. But that was uh, 53 years ago, and we still have the same segregation. So one of the things that happened is that uh, the, uh, the whites who bought homes with the government support uh, for loans and mortgages in the 40s and 50s and, and early 60s uh, experienced a dramatic increase in, in housing values in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, leading to vast differences in wealth. The African-Americans didn't have that. And so by the time the African-Americans began catching up in income, suburban housing was priced out of their market. And actually the discrepancy in home ownership today in, in, in uh, 2021 is actually greater than it was in 1968. But then there were lots of government programs that reinforced segregation. There were subsidies for low-income families uh, that helped support rent in minority areas where jobs were scarce. Uh, developers used federal tax credits to build low-income apartments in already segregated areas. Black enterprise zones further concentrated African-American economic activity in these segregated areas. And then zoning laws reinforced the status quo. What I have is a photograph on the right of the building of the Claiborne Highway in uh, New Orleans in 1968. Uh, what this highway did is they took tax dollars and used them to bulldoze uh, 400 oak trees, numerous African-American homes, replacing them with hundreds of thousands of yards of concrete that became the highway and instantly created a three mile long hotspot in the city's urban heat, heat island. And then the polluted stormwater running off the deck during rain events exacerbated flooding in Treme and in the seventh ward in New Orleans. Inhabitants of the Treme and the seventh ward have therefore experienced public health threats and, and economic stresses living from the compromised environment. But even more so, these highways, which were built for the, for the transportation needs of white suburbanites so that they could get in and out of the city, we used to separate and cut off African-American neighborhoods and separate them from white neighborhoods. Now, the Biden uh, infrastructure program that he presented to the Senate recently included $25 billion to reconnect some of these urban neighborhoods that were cut off, bulldozed and blighted uh, by these highways. Uh, but after the Senate proposal has whittled that down from 25 billion to 1 billion, which is still in the, in the program. So the, um, it's now 53 years later and people living in these neighborhoods are still impoverished. Well, no surprise, the bank's uh, refusal to invest in these areas and inability to start a business. Uh, there was inability to acquire wealth through home ownership. Uh, shortage of housing led to predatory landlords. We, we, the studies have shown that for similar quality housing, uh, rents are actually higher in these neighborhoods than they are in, in, in other white areas. And property taxes are actually also higher in these uh, poorer neighborhoods. Uh, mortgage deduction was not available to people living in these neighborhoods because they didn't own the homes. Uh, there's a marriage penalty for African Americans on their taxes. When, when, uh, when a, a couple unites, if there's a discrepancy in income between the husband and the wife, the federal tax generally goes down. 
if, if incomes are similar between husband and wife, then the joint filing, the taxes usually go up. Uh, and because there's a less of a discrepancy between what black men can make and what black women make, uh, more often than not, black families, when they uh, would get a marriage a penalty when they file jointly. Um, lack of nearby jobs lead to increased travel expenses uh, and poor housing perpetuates inequality and poverty becomes multi-generational. Uh, children have the burden of poorer schools, fewer role models and less access to summer jobs. Segregation also reduces political power. Uh, this is a photograph taken from 1982 uh, in, uh, in Warren County, North Carolina. The governor uh, had just uh, announced a plan to dump over a thousand truckloads of PCB contaminated dirt in a soybean field in, uh, in, in an area that was uh, mostly uh, inhabited by relatively uh, poor uh, African-Americans. And, and the PCBs were almost certain to seep into well water. Uh, these protests that you see depicted on the uh, slide trying to stop the truckloads coming in uh, failed and the PCBs were uh, deposited there. So what we understand is that, that, uh, that the extractive economy has sacrificed zones you know, areas of, uh, of environmental degradation where, where the extraction occurs, where waste is produced. And these sacrifice zones require sacrificing people. And studies have shown that if you look at the areas where there are toxic dumps, uh, air pollution, municipal landfills and incinerators, uh, race, not wealth, is the determining factor and the predictable factor of where you find these things. And so what happens is political isolation actually reduces the political power of uh, people. Um, yeah, in an African-American inner city neighborhood, oftentimes they can elect uh, an African-American representative, but that African-American representative is more often than not a minority in the chamber in which they uh, serve. The problem is that when people live in adjacent to each other, nearby each other, their interests in their community uh, begin to merge. Uh, when people are isolated, the particular interests and needs for that community become less compelling to, pe to people who are not uh, 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 living near, near the, those, that isolated community. And then there's the Hobson's choice. Um, People in, in, in uh, wealthy white suburbs can say, we don't want an incinerator in our area. People in inner city African-American communities, oftentimes besides not having the political power to eliminate it, often have a desire to have them because they're so desperate for jobs. And some of these dirty industries bring, bring jobs. And that's what I'm referring to as the, the Hobson's choice. So now let's look and see how, you know, how these impact uh, what's health today. Uh, if you look at this map on the left, and I, I'm sorry if it's a little bit too small to really see, but these gray areas, this is a map of Philadelphia, and these gray areas are the previously redlined areas. This is North Philly, South Philly, West Philly, uh, African-American community, African-American community, and, and this is a mixed uh, community. And this, there are little red dots here which show where the public housing is. And you can see, if you could see, um, most, almost all of these little red dots are in North Philly and West Philly. They're in the previously redlined areas. You now look over in, in this uh, map on the right. Uh, this is, a, again, the same map of uh, uh, North Philly, West Philly, the redlined areas. And these red dots now show the toxic brownfields, industrial sites. And you can see that almost all of these toxic brownfields, almost all of these industrial sites are in the same redlined areas where most of the public housing is. This is a photograph of a, uh, a sort of a typical urban scene. And you can see there's cement, a parking lot, there's some grass, some trees, some more cement. If you look at a photograph of this same scene with a camera that measures heat, uh, 
and the lighter the color, the greater the heat. So you can see that in this scene, the hottest areas are, are the, the road and the parking lot and the cement over here. Uh, this is not quite so hot. That's where the grass is. And then under the trees, shade, it's darker, it's cooler. The difference in temperature, and, and this, is what's, this is what's defined as a, uh, as a, you know, a heat island when it, when it gets hot. Um, now, if you look at Philadelphia and look at the location of these heat islands, and again, remember the red line communities are cement, no trees, not much green. And if you look north, if the, the darker the red, the greater the heat, the more likely to find heat islands. And you can see North Philly, West Philly, where most of these heat islands are. And if you look at the, the change in temperature from these top priority areas, these uh, darker red areas, the, 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 the change in temperature uh, in the summer on a summer day between these heat islands and the average temperature in Philadelphia it says right here, it's between like four and eight degrees. That's the difference between the average and the hot areas. The difference between the, the uh, hot and the cool areas out in, uh, in the suburbs can be six to, six to eight degrees, seven, eight degrees difference in temperature on a hot summer day. Now let's look and see what's happening with climate change. So if we define an excessive uh, heat event day uh, as a day in which the excess heat leads to a statistical increase in mortality due to the heat on that day. And you can see 20th century, there were only a few such days in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, a lot more now. And by the end of this, by the end of the century, assuming we don't do a whole lot about climate change, the dire prediction is that there'll be 73 such days in Philadelphia uh, and that represents an expected increase in heat of about uh, six to seven degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which would be expected. So that's six to seven degrees increase in temperature between here and here. That's a huge, a tenfold increase in the number of heat event days with a six to seven degree increase in temperature. And that's where we see the difference between a heat island in Philadelphia and the temperatures in, uh, in the suburbs. So what this tells us is that the localized harms of housing discrimination may equal or even exceed the harms of climate change and may double the local danger of climate change. In, uh, in June of, of 2019, there was an explosion at this oil finery on the left in the Grace Ferry neighborhood at Philadelphia, a previously redlined area. Uh, when this exploded, uh, fortunately this, uh, oil, this oil refinery has not uh, reopened, but when it exploded, there were huge billows of uh, toxic flames that you could see for miles away. Uh, the EPA monitors registered nothing because they were upwind from where, the, uh, where this explosion took, took place. Uh, people in the Grace Ferry neighborhood have been complaining about uh, health harms from that oil refinery for a long time. Uh, but let's see it. Let's look at the now. This map. This is a map of asthma in children in Philadelphia, and the red is the it's uh, asthma hospitalizations. The rate of asthma hospitalizations 2012 to 2014, and the uh, the dark red is the most. Dark blue the next. Light blue the next. And you can see North Philly, previously redlined area, is where the, there's the most asthma in children. Uh, West Philadelphia next. And clearly, this is a, in large part related to pollution and to the air pollution. But it isn't just Philadelphia. Uh, these are maps of San Francisco and Oakland. And if you look at these maps from the 1930s, this is San Francisco on the left, Oakland on the right. And if you look at the redlined areas in red, you can see where the redlined areas are in, in um, San Francisco. And you can see where the redlined areas are in Oakland. And now you look at, I think this was 2019. I'm not exactly sure what year this was. Um, if you look at the 
at those same areas, if you look at areas with asthma admissions, the darker the color, the more asthma admissions for children. And you can see in San Francisco, it, it tracks exactly the way the redlined areas were. And in Oakland, the same thing. Redlined areas uh, tracks exactly the way it tracked uh, in, in, uh, 20, in 1930 for the, with, the, um, uh, with the redlining. So after a century of housing discrimination, African-Americans are three times more likely to die from air pollution. That's uh, data from articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine. African-Americans are twice as likely to have childhood asthma, 10 times more likely to die from asthma because they breathe 38% more air pollution than whites, and they're exposed to 63% more air pollution than they produce by their own lifestyles. Formerly redlined areas experience hotter heat waves, higher prevalence of respiratory disease, more diabetes, more obesity, higher prevalence of stroke, but also poorer mental health because of all sorts of stresses, more poverty, more social vulnerability, and shorter life expectancy. And I think a good argument can be made that each one of these is at least in part, significant part, due to the fact of the housing discrimination, that, that people were forced to live in these neighborhoods with, with uh, uh, difficulty in moving out. So African Americans have suffered, but so have we all. We have greater social and political conflict because of unfamiliarity and political isolation of African Americans that has enabled political leaders to search for votes by racial appeals rather than sound policies for us all. Clustering children that are more likely to have health, economic, and social problems into schools diminishes the school's ability to give extra attention where it's needed. It also limits the children's abilities in white suburban schools to gain a broader exposure. And we've seen repeatedly in many settings that allowing multiple points of view leads to greater creativity and better problem solving. Economic stagnation in one segment of society inhibits economic growth in all segments. So what do we do about this? Well, as long as most Americans believe that segregation came about because of private prejudices and by accident uh, and by factors long since gone, it'll be very difficult to get political support to correct it. In 1974, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote that desegregation in Detroit schools could not be required to include the suburbs because black students were concentrated in, in city schools because in quote, this is a quote, because of unknown and perhaps unknowable factors such as in migration, birth rates, economic changes, or cumulative acts of private fears, end quote. Remember Detroit was the city where the FHA required a developer to build a wall to prevent Negro encroachment into white neighborhoods. Chief Justice John Roberts in 2007 wrote that because neighborhoods in Seattle and Louisville were segregated by quote, private choices, end quote, and not state action, it had no constitutional implications and school districts could be prohibited from taking action to reverse the resulting segregation. Two Supreme Court justices and their majorities were either willfully ignorant or just dishonest. Teaching the accurate history of segregation that was created intentionally by government mandate was, which thereby denied African-Americans their constitutional rights will go a long way to achieving at least some support for government restitution. So it's important to integrate the middle class as well as the poor. Um, it's the racial segregation, it's, it's, it's the issue. It isn't so much class segregation, it's the racial segregation. 
what we need to do is create zoning laws that encourage diversity and not restrict it. George Romney at HUD tried that in the 1970s when he was appointed by Nixon to HUD, uh, but he was forced out of office. Uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts currently have um, what's called, uh, um, well, I've, let's see, I'm trying to, they, they have uh, zoning laws that require uh, communities to set aside certain areas for, uh, for neighborhoods that have a varied uh, economic, uh, 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 you know, econ uh, economic uh, abilities. Uh, it's, not, it's not racial zoning that they require there, it's economic zoning, but at least they require uh, communities to have a certain amount of low income and middle income housing in their communities. Uh, the mortgage tax incentive uh, could uh, be used uh, to incentivize to communities to uh, integrate. So the real thing about mitigation though, is to understand that the extractive economy requires these sacrifice zones of environmental degradation. That's at sites of extraction, such as sites of fracking or, the, or wells and, and uh, mines at sites of utilization, such as the highways uh, or, at, uh, or at power plants, and at sites of disposal. These sacrifice zones marginalize the people who live in those areas. So racism is not a byproduct of this extractive economy. It's really a necessary ingredient. If we end the extractive economy, the health harms of these current sacrifice zones will disappear. If we transition to electronic vehicles, for example, those people who live in the, uh, with exposure to high traffic, uh, air pollution from traffic uh, will, will uh, be better off. Uh, if we transition to solar power uh, and have fewer uh, power plants, the people who live near the power plants will be better off. So transition and addressing climate change is an effective way to help mitigate the harms that have already been uh, put upon the, the, these uh, marginalized communities. And again, empowering the marginalized communities will help end the extractive economy because uh, if we give uh, not in my backyard power to more people, it'll be harder to, uh, to pursue these uh, dirty industries. So that's my talk. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have one more slide here of, uh, 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 for more information. And if anybody wants to contact me or has any questions or comments, I put my email address at the bottom. Uh, but these are largely the references that I used for this talk. So uh, I think we have time left for any uh, comments or discussion or questions. Thank you so much. Again, if folks have questions, please add them to the chat or the Q&A. You can also unmute yourself or raise your hand if you need me to unmute you to ask questions. Um, I was wondering if any of these resources talk about what can be done for soil reclamation and cleaning up the earth that's around these neighborhoods. Because once you've had these yeah. extractive yeah, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, I, I don't really know much about uh, how to how to do that kind of uh, renovations. Um, and I, I don't think these uh, these books uh, discuss much about the science of how do you remediate. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really have an answer for you. I was just curious. Because even once you solve the problem, even if people change, make choices about what they're using energy-wise, they're still clean up. That right. has to be done. So yeah. that's yeah. the next step, I guess. Any questions out there? I'll give it another second. But thank you, Dr. Tolan, for your webinar here. I think it's been very informative. Um, I definitely plan to read the color of law. It's been one of those things that have been on my list, so I need to have to it. Uh, looks here like Dr. Wolk is saying the PES site is a perfect example. Uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. The PES site is a perfect example. Oh. Can you tell us where that's located, Dr. Wolf? And I'm unmuting you in case you just want to talk or you can all say. Thank you. I do. PES is Philadelphia Energy Solutions. It's oh, okay. a winery that Dr. Cohen mentioned that has a red line neighborhood right next to it. Uh, and where the explosion was. And now it's been shut down, it's being dismantled, and it has over 100 years worth of refinery produced toxins in the soil. Mm -hmm. we, we really don't know what's there, how deep it goes, or anything. And Foco, the company that now has purchased the property, is, is contracted to actually clean it up but it's going to take ongoing and continuous vigilance on the part of the public to make sure that really happens in a way that allows people who are using that site in the future for whatever use it is, say an industrial park, maybe even recreation, to make sure that is safe. Um, there was an article in the Hidden City website a couple of years ago about a baseball field that is right next to the refinery site that's built on top of toxic waste and there are actually high levels of hydrocarbons in the air at that site most of the time where people are playing baseball so you really want to avoid that happening and uh, of course the worst thing would be if housing were built in that on that area and not protected from what's underground. Yeah, Thank that's, you. sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, that's my fear in all of this, right? You solve one problem, but then there's still many that are going to follow. Yeah. Uh, that also raises an environmental justice issue with the transition to non-carbon fuels, such as manufacture of car batteries, batteries for uh, backing up a power grid, um, manufacture of electric cars. All of these industries are potentially polluting and there's going to be a tendency to cite them in disadvantaged neighborhoods because that's the way it's always been done. Mm -hmm. so, it's up to organizations like PSR to advocate for these communities to save off environmental racism, as Dr. Tolan so aptly uh, pointed out. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, well. Thank you, Dr. Tolan. Thank you to our guests as well. Um, we'll see you again next month. You can rewatch this on Facebook and it will also be added to the website. I'll release everyone to the rest of their evening while it's still nice outside. Bye-bye.